past several years. Uh, and uh, this work has been done uh, with collaborators from both Columbia University, where I was, where I was a uh, postdoc, and also the Hebrew uh, University of Jerusalem, where I also was a postdoc before uh, going to Columbia. Uh, okay, so here's my outline. Uh, first, I'm going to say a couple of general uh, words about Montgomery verse R and how they manifest observationally. Uh, then I'm going to uh, talk uh, about how they produce uh, their emission, which is sort of the, the field that, that I've been uh, most interested in. Uh, I'll separately talk about uh, this, oh, sorry, the so-called prompt emission, uh, which is the, sort of the most intense phase of the gamma ray first, uh, burst emission. Lasts very briefly, only typically about 10 uh, seconds. I'll talk about how, it, how we think it is produced. Uh, how we have attempted to model it and what we can learn by, by uh, fitting the models to the available data. Uh, in the second part of my talk, uh, I, I will uh, slightly switch topic and talk about the so-called afterglow emission, uh, which typically comes after the prompt MEV emission has uh, ceased. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on, on uh, sort of the very high energy end of this uh, afterglow emission uh, and talk about uh, emission in the GV band. Also, uh, how, uh, how we can model this and uh, what we can learn from, from those uh, models. Okay, so uh, a few words about history first. Uh, gamma ray bursts were discovered in 1967 uh, by the US uh, Vela satellites uh, which were actually not astrophysical instruments at all. They were there to monitor compliance with the, the 1963 uh, nuclear test ban treaty between the US and the Soviets. Uh, but in 1967 they de detected a brief flash of gamma rays, uh, which became uh, apparent that it was not of terrestrial origin. Uh, so, so it was uh, understood that it is some kind of previously unknown astrophysical uh, phenomenon. Initially, the discovery was classified, but it was declassified a couple of years later, and the first gamma ray burst uh, paper appeared in 1973. Uh, this was followed by what's now known as, as, as the sort of dark ages uh, in gamma ray burst uh, physics. <coughs> Mm, uh, because uh, not much was known for a long time uh, of those. Uh, people detected more of them, but, but uh, they had no idea even if they are very close or very far away. Uh, and at some point there were more models, different models about what they could be than there That's were insane. actual gamma ray bursts themselves. Uh, this began to change uh, in the beginning of the 90s with the launch of the, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which could better localize them, uh, it became apparent that, that uh, they are distributed uh, fairly isotropically across the sky, which uh, strongly hinted that they, they probably are cosmological rather than, for example, galactic. There is no concentration to the galactic plane. Uh, and the, the, this issue was finally settled by the Beppo Sachs Observatory which was a, uh, an X-ray instrument, which could get uh, rapidly get the precise positions of, of gamma ray bursts, uh, leading to optical follow-up. And from optical, you can get the redshifts, and it became clear that that they really are very far away, cosmological objects, uh, which implied that actually the energy budget of those uh, events has to be huge. About at least supernova's worth of energy coming out in MEV in a matter of seconds. Uh, okay, and the, the final the important milestone was the launch, uh, came with the launch of the, the uh, Fermi telescope. The main instrument on Fermi, sorry, uh, was um, or is uh, the so-called LAT instrument, Large Area Telescope. Uh, which is sensitive between about 20 MeV to, to uh, about 300 GeV. And actually, this, uh, in terms of GRB observations, the, uh, there were some surprising results that came from that. I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, okay, so how do they manifest observationally? 
uh, the, the remission can be divided uh, uh, into two categories, prompt emission and uh, so-called afterglow emission. The prompt comes first, is uh, most intense, and when you look at the light curves, uh, they are highly erratic. Uh, with, with many different uh, timescales of variability, uh, they have typically a sudden onset and, and very often uh, abrupt end. Uh, and the energy uh, that, that comes out uh, when you come from the redshift is, is anywhere between 10 to 51 to, to 10 to 55 or zero. Uh, this, as for the spectrum, uh, in many cases it's, it, it, it's can be fitted by a relatively uh, simple uh, <coughs> broken uh, power law uh, and usually uh, peaks in the, in the MEV, close to 1 MEV. Uh, now, the afterglow that comes later uh, is very different. First of all, when you look at the light curves, they are typically quite smooth and, uh, and most of the time they are just uh, so, sort of monotonically uh, declining functions uh, of time. Uh, and when you look at the spectrum, actually, you see that the afterglow emission uh, spans the entire, essentially the entire elect electromagnetic spectrum from radio to, to GV, and we actually also think TV gamma rays. Okay, so the, the huge energy budget that this prompt emission has. Uh, coupled with the fast variability immediately sort of leads to uh, a, in some sense obvious problem. From the variability you can det uh, deduce the, the yeah, minimal size of the emitting region that you need to have uh, basically by the, uh, by the light crossing argument. Uh, you also know your luminosity. So you know basically uh, how many photons need to be produced in this region uh, to account for this luminosity. Uh, but when you put this into such a small volume, it turns out, uh, you, you can calculate this quite easily, that the opacity that these photons uh, see interacting with other photons, remember these are MeV photons which can, which can interact with, uh, with each other producing electron positron pairs. The associated opacity is huge uh, unless the source is moving relativistically, highly relativistically. Uh, and now we think that that has to be the case. The source has to be moving towards the observer with a Lorentz factor of about uh, at least 100. Uh, this helps in two ways. First of all, it, uh, due, to, due to the Doppler effect, it contracts the observed uh, uh, timescales, whatever timescales you have in this uh, intrinsic variability. And also, you need smaller co-moving uh, energy density to account for the observed luminosity. So we're dealing with a higher, higher optimistic sources. Uh, okay, so the picture, the general picture that has emerged uh, over the past decades about these objects is, is roughly as follows. We have to be dealing with, some, uh, with the birth of a compact object, uh, a black hole or a neutron star, because this is the, this is the only known way how you can liberate such a huge amount of energy in such short time. It has to be very compact and very, very, very uh, energetic event. Uh, now, there are two types of objects where we think that this, uh, this can happen. First is some sort of a supernova-like event. Uh, this is called a collapsor model. Alternatively, uh, you, can you, you could have the coalescence uh, of a binary compact object, like, like a binary neutron star or a neutron star black hole merger. Uh, now, shortly after this birth of this new compact object, you have a lot of debris around, and you have a, you have a sort of a brief period of, of uh, hyper accretion, very high accretion rate onto this uh, compact object. And under suitable conditions, in particular where you have significant angular momentum there, uh, this configuration can launch a pair of uh, highly relativistic jets. Now, in the case of this uh, uh, supernova-like event, which I'm going to concentrate my, uh, in my talk on, uh, this jet first has to uh, drill its way through the parent star. But, uh, while doing that, it's, it, it's still relatively slow. Uh, but after it has sort of broken out of the star, uh, it rapidly accelerates 
to this, this kind of Lorentz factors that I mentioned already, uh, eventually it, it expands so that it, enough so that it becomes transparent. Uh, and then, by some mechanism, uh, first it generates uh, the, the, a collimated beam of this MEV emission. This is what we see as prompt emission uh, by some form of uh, dissipation that's internal to the jet. Uh, why internal? Because this is the only way you can, you can sort of, uh, account for this high variability without any long-term trend in the, in the, in the light curve. Uh, somewhat later, the jet runs into, into the ambient <coughs> medium, which, which can be uh, either ISM or, for example, the, the stellar wind of the progenitor. Uh, it creates a shock ahead of itself. And the shock, uh, shocks, as we know, they can accelerate particles. Uh, and these par accelerated particles can emit both synchrotron and inverse Compton radiation uh, and give rise to this multi-wavelength uh, afterglow that is uh, observed. Now, for a long time, people thought that, that uh, the emission that the jet emit, uh, well, comes from the jet, uh, when it becomes transparent, uh, should be thermal. It's sort of natural to assume that. Uh, but to account for this highly non-thermal sp uh, prompt spectrum, people thought that, oh, this must be related to some dissipation events uh, that take place in the optically thin part of the outflow. And in particular, uh, the popular model was the, the um, or still is actually, uh, the synchrotron shock model, where variabilities within the jet uh, lead to shocks, shocks in the jet, and these shocks can accelerate particles and emit synchrotron radiation. Well, as we will see, uh, this is wrong. The emission that you expect from the photosphere generally is not thermal, and the synchrotron radiation in most, uh, most, but by far, in most cases, uh, cannot account for the observed emission. Uh, I'll show this uh, in a moment. Okay, so let's go in, into a little bit more detail about the prompt emission. As you saw, the light curves are highly variable and very, can be very different. Some of them actually are, are behave quite smoothly, but in general, uh, they, are, they are highly erratic. Now, the, as for the spectrum, uh, it's oftentimes uh, rather simple and can be fitted by this, what, what's become known as the band function, uh, which is little more than, than the smoothly broken power law. And the problem with this kind of uh, phenomenological function is that it's not immediately associated with any, uh, any particular physical mechanism. So for a long time, people didn't know, and there's still, there are still debates. What is the physical mechanism that is producing this, this prompt radiation? And also, where inside this jet is it produced? So, by and large, uh, there are two classes of, of uh, models and two, two sort of schools uh, of thought about the, where, the, where and how the prompt emission is produced. Uh, the optically thin and optically thick uh, model. Now, the optically thin models have, have uh, uh, enjoyed sort of long uh, prevalence and popularity. Uh, I already mentioned them a little bit. This is when, when, when you think that the, the emission comes from uh, internal shocks within the jet in the optically thin region uh, via synchrotron emission. Alternatively, uh, <coughs> and this is, this is sort of the school of thought that I subscribe to, uh, is uh, the emission could come or be released close to the Thomson photosphere. Uh, I should mention that the Thomson, Thomson scattering is the main uh, source of opacity in these environments. So at some point uh, the, the, the jet becomes optically thin and releases whatever radiation field it's carrying with it. Uh, now, now the crucial ingredient here is, is, is uh, dissipation. It turns out if the heat is dissipative and uh, sort of heats the particles by, by liberating some form of, of free energy within it, then the emission that you expect from the photosphere is not thermal and actually quite robustly can, can uh, attain this, this kind of characteristic non-thermal shape. I'll show this in a moment. <coughs> okay, so what's wrong with the optically thin uh, synchrotron models? 
Uh, I think the strongest argument against it is, is uh, comes from the spectrum. When you look at look at uh, the spectral shape, and in particular, the full width half maximum of the spectrum, the, those spectra are relatively narrow, despite the fact that actually we cannot resolve the shortest time scales, and they are already when you make such kind of spectrum, they are already sort of temporal averages over some bins. Uh, still, what you get uh, is, is is something r relatively narrow uh, when you plot the full width half maxima uh, or the burst according to their full width half maxima you see that most of them uh, have, have about uh, one decade are, are about one decade wide so you can compare this to different physical processes or or, or uh, photon distributions well Planck function is sort of the narrowest that you can think of or we maybe even narrower or is uh, but it's, it's, it's a thermal shape, which is not what you observe. Now, for synchrotron, you can see that already from Max, a synchrotron from Maxwellian electrons, which is sort of the narrowest particle distribution that you can physically expect, uh, the spectrum that you get is already too broad. And this is even without accounting for the fact that actually you cannot have Maxwellian electrons there. They will cool and they will have some sort of broad distribution. Uh, in the jet, which makes it even even broader. So, in my opinion, this is the strongest argument that synchrotron in general cannot work. Uh, another, perhaps a little bit weaker argument, has, has to do with the spectral peaks. When you plot the verse according to the spectral peaks, you, you see that they, cluster, they tend to cluster around a couple of hundred keV. This is peak position. Mm. And when you're dealing with optically thin synchrotron or optically thin, basically any kind of emission, uh, there is no a priori reason why the spectral peaks should uh, concentrate in any particular back, uh, like range. Uh, and the final nail in the coffin is uh, for synchrotron models uh, comes from the low energy slope of the spectrum. Now this this is not this is uh, it's not it's not really genes, so it's 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 still very non thermal uh, shape. But it's still too hard uh, uh, to be accounted for, for uh, by most, uh, most synchrotron models. I, I will not go into detail here, but you can, one can work this out quite easily. Okay, so how do we generate this, those hard uh, and narrowly peaked spectra that, that usually peak in the vicinity of MEV? Well, our answer to this is opacity. And this leads to those, uh, those optically thick or, or so-called photospheric models. Now, this uh, leads to a solution to, to several issues. First of all, this, the narrowness of the spectrum is no longer a problem. The, the, the photospheric spectra, in principle, can be as narrow as Planck, if need be. Uh, as for the uh, peak positions, uh, this is a little bit more involved, uh, but but it turns out that there is a, a sort of a natural scale in the problem, which is the average photon energy close to the central source. And the central source is about 10 kilometers across, very small. Uh, now, if the jet were to simply take those photons uh, and carry them out and release them whenever it becomes optically thin, uh, you would see the same average photon energy. Uh, at, at, uh, in the center, it's about 5 to 10 MeV, the typical energy of the photon. So this is what you would expect to see if they ju were just carried out and released. Well, it's sort of in the right neighborhood, uh, but it's not quite right. It's about an order of magnitude too high, because the typical peaks, or average photon energies, if you will, uh, are about well, several hundred keV. That means that there has to be additional photon production uh, taking place as the jet expands. And this turns out actually to be a non-trivial problem. Uh, and the other th important thing is, is the non-thermal shape. Uh, and it turns out that, that the answer to mo both this question of, of having the right amount of photons to get the peak right and have the, the right shape of the spectrum, the answer to both com questions comes in the form of, of uh, dissipation. They can be resolved if we say that the jet is dissipative throughout most of its expansion history, starting from very deep below the photosphere all the way through the photosphere. Uh, why we think this, is, this could be the case? Well, first, 
you can look at the, uh, uh, the light curves and, and their power density spectra, for example. You see that there are many different temporal scales uh, represented. And since they are produced in the variable jet, they probably translate into some form of, uh, of variability within the jet, which, uh, which could include, for example, variability in the, in the Lorentz factors of different parts of the jet. Uh, and different scales tend to, uh, tend to sort of dissipate or create shocks, for example, at different radii. So, by and large, you can say that your, your jet is, uh, is heated across a uh, broad range of radii. Also, you can look at uh, some of the hydro simulations that, have, uh, that people have done for this. You also see that the jet, which is, which is this narrow thing here, uh, is far from just expanding passively. It has shocks within it, for, first of all, uh, because of its interaction with, the, with the, the star it has to break out from, also the cocoon that it builds around itself after it has broken out. Uh, so it, this leads to the so-called recollimation shock on top of those, those uh, in, uh, internal shocks that you get from the intrinsic jet variability. Also, if the jet is magnetized, you, for example, can have a kind of reconnection events occurring throughout its expansion. Uh, now, as it turns out, the radiation field that eventually is released once the jet becomes optically thin, and this is what comes to, to the observer, uh, knows a lot about this expansion history, even starting from well beyond the photosphere. So it's not localized. Uh, whatever, whatever is producing the, the, the emission that we see, it is not localized to any particular radius. It probably goes on it's like over, over a range, large range of radii as the jet expands. Okay, so here's our, uh, our sort of model or, or cartoon uh, of, of what we think is happening. So this pink region uh, represents some form of, of, of heating or dissipation within the jet, uh, which starts at, uh, already at that very high optical depths. Now, at high optical depths, the, the photon field is in, in uh, kinetic equilibrium with the particles and has, in general, a, a Bose-Einstein shape. So if you dissipate energy there, you can generate, for example, more photons via, say, synchrotron or, or double Compton emission. But all those photons will be sort of equilibrated, uh, brought to this kinetic equilibrium uh, into this, this uh, Bose-Einstein uh, distribution. And the process that is doing that is, is Compton scattering, which is sort of the fastest, fastest process uh, that you have uh, in these environments. But the effect of this uh, effect of dissipation essentially is, is producing more photons, which if you have to share the same energy among more photons, means that, that the, 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 the peak will go towards lower energies, uh, actually into the domain uh, that, is, that is most favorable. Around 1 MeV will be the result. Now, if you go to larger radii, uh, the opacity becomes less and less, and at some point it no longer can do this. You can still dissipate energy, uh, you can still generate more photons, but they will, uh, they will not reach uh, this peak anymore. What instead, what actually happens is that you start broadening uh, the distribution. The, for example, Compton scattering will start uh, uh, scattering some of the photons from the peak towards high energies, creating this this power low tail that, that is observed, and also uh, the low energy uh, photons that, that get produced, by, for example, by synchrotron. Uh, they tend to make this this low energy part shallower. And at the end of the day, the spectrum that gets released eventually when the jet is optically thin quite robustly has this, uh, has, has this general uh, broken power law shape. Now, how do we model this? Well, uh, by solving the radiative transfer equation in the, in the relativistic jet. Uh, this is sort of, looks relatively simple, but actually the devil is in the details. When you try to put all the physical processes with, uh, into it, which, which are those terms here, uh, things become quite complicated and especially complicated for, for uh, uh, trying to get a stable numerical scheme out of that. But, but I'm not going to talk about that, it would be too boring. Uh, anyway, this is the equation we solve. This equation is coupled to a kinetic equation for uh, electrons and positrons, <coughs> which I'm not showing. Uh, also, we have to take into account that the intense radiation field uh, can actually accelerate the jet as you, uh, as you go along. Uh, 
here this this i prime is is the co-moving uh, co-moving radiation flux essentially this is what what is pushing the jet towards high Lorentz vector so you put this all together into a numerical scheme and uh, and you, you can run it uh, and here's the uh, yeah I'll skip that uh, here is uh, here is the result now this this is a movie of a simulation where we start the simulation at a relatively small radius or high optical depth uh, where the distribution is, is, is Wien. We switch on dissipation and we start following it as a function of radius, how the, how the radiation field uh, evolves as we go along. Uh, sorry. Uh, how can I... Hmm. Okay. So initially you can see that the, at least close to the peak uh, the shape remains more or less the same, but due to photon production, the peak starts moving towards lower energies. When you get to optical depths of, of about uh, 100, then the peak sort of stops moving and you start getting this broadening that I was talking about uh, because of Compton scattering of photons from the peak. And at the end of the day, you have this more or less uh, characteristic broken uh, power law shape. Now we try to apply this this model to actual uh, actual bursts, and then try to sort of fit the data. I should say right away that since the simulation is quite expensive, we have do not done any kind of uh, formal fitting of the data. What we did is we just took the, the phenomenological fit from the from the literature and see whether we can reproduce it, basically by eye. Uh, and we see that that it can be done. Uh, from this fit you can, or mock fit if you will, uh, we can infer uh, different quantities about the jet, for example its Lorentz factor uh, and also its magnetization which is a relatively poor known, known quantity. Uh, what's also significant uh, I should say is, is, is that there have been not so many attempts to fit actual GRB data with the physical model. Most of the, most of the fits that have been done are exactly this kind of band, band type, phenomen purely phenomenological fits. There are one or two bursts where, where people have tried to fit actual synchrotron uh, models to that, and, uh, and in some cases you can succeed, but in most cases it doesn't work. Okay, so this is the same thing, just to show with, with data points. Again, this is not a formal fit, but you can see that it more or less uh, our result more or less goes through the data point. Uh, here's another one, perhaps not so interesting. Uh, here is the famous 090902B. Uh, now, the, uh, the phenomenological fit for that one required first this, this broken power law or band shape and, uh, and, and an additional uh, power law to account for the, the, the spectral shape. But with our model, you can see that, that by varying the, the dissipation uh, rates and profiles, actually this kind of complex shape, or well, more complex shape, I should say, uh, can be reproduced by the model, at least qualitatively. Uh, and we think that actually this, this kind of uh, spectrum with, with more features uh, should give us more confidence that whatever, whatever parameters we're referring, for example, for the, for the Lorentz factor or uh, for say the jet magnetization, uh, they should be actually well, correspond to reality. Uh, there's le less room here for, for <coughs> any kind of degeneracies, for example, between the different parameters. Okay, I will skip that and I will come to my conclusion about this uh, prompt emission. We think that prompt emission is made by in, in jets that are dissipative uh, along, along their expansion. You can create uh, non thermal. Uh, narrow spectra as you observe uh, and different heating histories can actually result in a variety of, of spectral shapes and when you fit the data you can reconstruct the jet properties such as for example the, the, uh, the heating history as well as the Lorentz factor and so on okay so now I'll slightly switch topics and <coughs> talk about the early afterglow Remember, this is the emission that comes when the prompt, usually comes when the prompt emission is already ceased. It can also come, as we will see, 
uh, while the prompt emission is going on. Uh, now, when Fermi was launched uh, and started observing GRBs, uh, it saw, well, in my opinion, something sort of peculiar. There is a peculiar recurrent behavior uh, in the light curves whenever you have good enough data. First of all, the GV emission, or well, emission above 100 MeV, I should say, uh, starts with a delay. This, the, the time is counted from uh, basically from the onset of the prompt emission. So there is a couple of second delay, usually. Then there is a single peak, and then relatively smooth and monotonic decay, uh, and the emission uh, in the GV band lasts typically much longer, or significantly longer, I should say, uh, than the prompt emission. Now, the end of the prompt emission is denoted by, the, by this, this red vertical line. This is where the prompt MEV emission is done. Now, this kind of behavior is characteristic of uh, the afterglow, rather than the prompt as being the origin. So we think, and people think, that, that it's produced when the jet interacts with the, the ambient medium and creates a shock ahead of it. Now, the fact that in many cases the peak of the GEV uh, light curve occurs while the prompt emission is still going on, actually it, it turns out to be significant. It rules out a whole, whole class of, uh, of uh, models. Normally what you expect uh, from the afterglow is that it would peak when, whenever the jet is in, uh, transferring most of its energy uh, to the external medium. This happens at the so-called deceleration radius. Right when the jet is becoming significantly decelerated uh, by the medium around. Uh, but it doesn't work for, uh, for GV because the peak is too early. Uh, I won't again go into detail here, but you can show that, that you cannot observe, whatever the external medium density, you cannot observe the jet to be decelerating uh, while the prompt emission is still going on. So something, something else has to be responsible for the delay and for the peak. Uh, as for the physical process that is responsible for the, for the GV emission, again, as usual in this business, there are two main contenders, uh, synchrotron and inverse Compton. Again, one can argue uh, that synchrotron probably does not work because it has a hard limit in, in the photon energy that it can produce. It's a few tens of, of uh, uh, mega electron volt in the co-moving frame, and if you account for the Lorentz boost, you get to about, at most, uh, 10 GeV. It cannot produce high energy fo higher energy photons than that. But you do observe almost, almost 100 GeV photons. So again, uh, it seems that synchrotron is, is, is disfavored. Uh, inverse Compton, on the other hand, is much more natural. Because, as you saw, the peak of the GV emission occurs while the prompt emission is still going on. That means that whatever particles are producing this emission, they are embedded in this intense MeV radiation field. And they are strongly cooled uh, via inverse Compton scattering by this MeV radiation field. And this, this, this uh, uh, should correspond to, to inverse Compton emission. Now, to account for this, uh, this uh, peculiar behavior of the light curve, one with its delay and the peak during the prompt and so on, uh, we proposed uh, with, with uh, my collaborators at Columbia the following model. Now, please bear with me here. This, this looks sort of convoluted. Actually, it's, it's not so bad as it, as it looks at first sight. Uh, the mechanism is inverse Compton scattering of prompt MEV radiation in the forward shock in a peer-rich external medium. I'll go step by step here to, to explain what is going on. Now, as the jet expands, at some point, by some internal mechanism, it's producing the prompt emission. But the prompt emission is not immediately leaving the jet. Because, remember, the jet is moving essentially at the speed of light. Uh, so, the pro prompt radiation front, which is in this, uh, this sort of sketch, is denoted by this uh, pink region, uh, overlaps the jet for quite a while, gradually overtaking it. And if the jet, for example, interacts with the external medium and creates the shock here, 
the shock is initially embedded into this prompt radiation field. Now, those MEV photons that have overtaken uh, the shock, they are ahead of it, they lead to an interesting effect. Uh, the external medium particles that this prompt radiation sort of overtakes, that, that suddenly find themselves in this prompt, strong prompt radiation field, they can scatter photons out of it. And now, the scattered photons find themselves at large angles with respect to other pho prompt photons. And they can produce a pair, because they are, they are MEV photons, they can produce pairs. And now this <coughs> pair can continue this process. It can scatter further photons, and they can produce further pairs. <coughs> pairs. So one single ex uh, external medium electron <coughs> can lead, give rise to a huge number of, of secondary pairs before they are overtaken by the shock. And now the shock comes, shocks all those, all those uh, created pairs. Now we have suddenly a huge amount of emitters available that can upscatter this very same MEV radiation to the GV band and give rise to this, uh, this, this, this very uh, intense flash. Now, I should also say here that actually yeah, it looks convoluted, but it's, it's relatively simple uh, in a sense that it, it, it doesn't involve any complex or poorly understood physics. You can model all of this, all this pair avalanche, also their emission after they've been shocked with the pairs. You can model uh, this from first principles using uh, a Monte Carlo simulation. And this is exactly what we have done. Uh, now here's a movie. The green uh, thing is an electron. And you can see it's standing still, it's an external medium electron. And this is the prompt radiation front, pink one, that's coming. It's overtaking this. And now this electron begins to scatter uh, photons from this prompt radiation field, which appear as those red dots here. And now these red dots can interact with other prompt photons and produce pairs. And these, the, the, these secondary pairs appear as, as uh, the small red circles. These pairs scatter further photons and so on and so on. So by the time the shock arrives, which is this black thing here, this single electron has multiplied into a huge number of secondaries. And they will all now get shocked, uh, heated up, and, and will produce uh, intense inverse Compton emission by scat upscattering these, these prompt photons. Okay, so here I'm so showing this, this pair multiplicity as a function of radius. The pair multiplicity is basically how many secondary pairs do you have per, one, per single uh, electron that you start with. You can see that, that and this is the, shock, the, the radius of the shock. You can see that at early times this, this can be really huge, uh, like 10 to 4, 10 to 5 particles uh, per single initial uh, electron. Uh, now, on the right here, I'm showing the, the typical Lorentz factor of those particles after they have been sort of heated up by the shock. And as the pair loading goes down, this average energy per particle goes up. Basically, the basic reason is that, that you have less and less particles, you have the same amount of energy available between them, uh, so you have less particles to share it with, the characteristic energy for a given particle will increase. And that's what we think leads to this, this characteristic delay of the GV emission. Basically, initially you have too many pairs and too little energy per pair to scatter MEV photons into the GV domain. In Compton scattering uh, of relativistic particles, basically the, the typical energy of the scattered photon goes as Lorentz factor squared times the energy of the initial uh, part. So, uh, oh, photon, I'm sorry. So once this quantity reaches about 30, so that the square is about 1000, you start scattering MEV photons into the GV domain. And this is where we think uh, the GV emission uh, peaks. And after the peak, the decline is, is basically because you have less and less pairs available, 
and also at some point the jet begins to uh, gradually decelerate and dis dissipate less and less energy. Uh, okay, <coughs> so what does the light curve look like? As again, the data points uh, correspond to a famous, uh, famous burst of 809.16c. Uh, and here is, here is the result of our model. Again, the modeling is expensive and this is not a formal thing, but it's just it's sort of a proof of concept. Uh, you see that, that, that this mechanism can give rise to this uh, delay, uh, this very bright peak and long decline. Now, one reason why this is sort of significant is that, that this model has very few parameters. It has, has only four parameters. Uh, and it, it sort of greatly contributes to its predictive power. For example, the timing of this peak is directly related uh, to the density of the external media. Uh, and for example, for this burst, we find that this density and also the profile of the external media is consistent with being uh, the wind of, of, uh, of the Wolf Rea progenitor. There's been a long debate about this, uh, about actually the, the external medium, which is not so easy to constrain by other methods. Uh, the natural expectation is, is that it's a Wolf Rea wind, because we think that progenitors are Wolf Rea stars, but some people still sort of say that, 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 that it might also be the, the, the constant ISM. Uh, clearly, if not for this one. Uh, also, what is, what is sort of a strong point of this, this model is that we don't require any non-thermal acceleration, particle acceleration at the shock. That is, the particles are heated, which is sort of a robust mechanism that has, has to operate. Uh, we don't rely on, on non-thermal acceleration of, say, a small fraction of particles to very high energies. The physics of this is not, not so well uh, understood yet. Okay, so we try to do this for the same thing for uh, fitting for uh, for other bursts whenever there is good GV data available, and in all bursts that we tried, the external medium is consistent uh, with the Wolf Rea uh, progenitor wind. Also, you can from this modeling you can get constraints on the uh, uh, jet Lorentz factor, and in some cases also also the forward shock magnetization, which is another parameter that, that has been sort of long debated and and uh, not very well uh, constrained. Okay, so there are yeah, a couple of more of those, uh, those kinds of fits. Seem, seems to work rather well. Uh, now, a nice confirmation for the model uh, came with, with also a very, very well-known burst, 130427A. Uh, uh, we were lucky enough that there were very early optical observations available, starting from, see, a few seconds. Uh, and what they saw is that there is an optical peak simultaneous with the GV peak. And this is exactly what the model predicts. Because the same particles that are giving rise to this, this GV emission have to also emit uh, synchrotron radiation uh, on, the, on the magnetic field <coughs> in the shock. And this, this emission, uh, well, it comes out in sort of many different domains, but optical is one of the main, main regions where this synchrotron emission should come out. Uh, and in this case, we, one can, we can also uh, constrain the, the Lorentz factor, uh, I'm sorry, the, the magnetization uh, of the jet. Okay, I'll skip that. Uh, and finally, the same model also predicts that in many bursts we should expect significant emission uh, at even higher energies in the TV band. Now, this region can be observed uh, by ground-based Cherokov instruments, and indeed, in several uh, in several cases, people have done follow-up observations uh, by TV observatories. So far, unfortunately, uh, no TV emission from GLBs has been detected. We think uh, we know the reason, for, at least one of the reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the sensitivity of TV instruments uh, rapidly goes down as you go below about 100 GB. On the other hand, given the typical Lorentz factors, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, redshifts uh, of GRBs, uh, 
the EBL extinction, basically the, the extinction by the extragalactic black background light due to peer production of those, uh, goes up quickly as you go above about 100 GeV. So you really have a narrow window close to 100 GeV where you can hope uh, for a TV detection. And we, we hope that the next generation instruments, which will be much more sensitive than the current ones, for example the CTA, uh, will uh, observe this TV emission at least, hopefully, a couple of bursts per year. Okay, so it seems that I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll leave my conclusions. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Please, questions? Uh, you were speaking about synchrotron and uh, uh, radiation. Uh, 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 is, it, uh, is it natural to get this sort of mag magnetic field needed for synchrotron? Uh, in, the shock in the shock Yeah, yeah in the shock uh, Yes, in some sense, uh, uh, I should say yes. Uh, basically, peak simulations that people are, be are doing show that this magnetic field is self-generated uh, when the shock forms. What they don't know uh, is what happens to this, this magnetic field uh, as you go further downstream. Mm -hmm. Remember the, the, the scales that are involved in, in collisionless uh, acceleration are very short, mm -hmm. uh, of the order of the plasma scale. So they are very small. They know what happens in this scale, on these scales, more or less. But, but uh, there is not, not enough dynamic range to, uh, of the simulations to, uh, to see what happens. Of course, the jet itself also probably carries the magnetic field from the star. So it's it might not be just generated at the show. I have uh, several questions, but I start with uh, <coughs> one very interesting for cosmology. Namely, so as these objects are the m most remote objects in the universe, then maybe there is possibility instead of first A supernova to continue in the region a more large uh, uh, Z parameters. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I what think. is the uh, extreme value observed <coughs> for uh, that redshift? I think currently uh, it's like 8.2 or 8.3, something like that. 8 point? 8 point something, redshift. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, 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 uh, so I don't know this in detail, but I know that people have, uh, have, attempt, uh, uh, have made attempts to constrain cosmological models mm -hmm. based on GRBs. But the problem is that, that they are not standard candles. We don't know, uh, we don't understand the, the sort of the intrinsic properties well enough. There are like, empirical correlations that have been seen, and uh, people have tried to sort of calibrate this, but, but uh, the errors are quite large. That means that, uh, that uh, to know they cannot be used in cosmology for very uh, far distances. And well, we need to understand them better. I mean, if we understand the intri uh, their intrinsic properties, yeah. then, then we could. Mm -hmm. yes. Second, uh, what is the general number of uh, these uh, objects? Uh, observation of about one a day. About one GRB per day is detected. And has anybody seen a, a recurrent GRB? No. <laughs> this would, uh, well, they, uh, well, what do you mean by recurrent? There yeah. are... Um, when you look at the, uh, more of the slide curves, there are some where there are Medic periods of quiescence yes. and yes. then suddenly again activity. But this is on a maybe a minute time scale. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, we are defining properties that there are one time events. One. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. Lorentz factors, because uh, particles have different masses, uh, this must be probably different for different uh, <coughs> particles. For which particles you, you have given this? Uh, uh, well, I mean, you cannot, uh, you have, for example, if you have electrons and, <coughs> and positrons, uh, you cannot separate them. As soon as you try to separate them, there are... So there are they have approximately the same velocities? Yeah, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yes. 
as soon as you start have some, having sort of some yeah, yeah. Uh, separation, it, it will lead to currents yeah. if you start to separate yeah, yeah, them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you will immediately have some sort of, of uh, plasma instability and so on. So, so mm -hmm. they will be coupled. Um, you mentioned um, the part of, the, of this expanding jet. Uh, also, uh, that um, you have this uh, um, economization shocks, internal yeah. shocks, and uh, magnetic reconnection as possibility. Yes. So uh, it would include also uh, the magnetic fields from the from the original star. Or? Yes. Yes. I mean, uh, this is. Uh, I should have said that actually all those uh, the dissipation basically that we put in is is put in in some sense phenomenologically. We're trying to sort of constrain what the dissipation profile mm -hmm. should be based on comparison with the data. It's, uh, we're not at the stage, uh, I don't think anybody is at the stage yet to, to uh, know what this, uh, like put in this dissipation from first principles. There are several ideas how it could work. So this is the problem of this internal structure? As, as yes, yes, yeah. yes. And then I have a question because you say uh, there's shock magnetization. I mean, uh, if there's shock magnetization, um, it means that uh, the magnetic field also undergoes this shock. So, uh, what about uh, uh, Fermi acceleration of particles? Because you, ex you should seem to exclude uh, that uh, acceleration by non thermal uh, process can take place. Is it, can it play a role also, Fermi acceleration? Or uh, it depends on what, what, what stage of, uh, of expansion we're talking about. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we're deep below the photosphere, then thermal acceleration cannot work. Uh, probably, most probably, because uh, because the shock will be mediated by radiation. Essentially, a strong radiation field close to the shock will smear it out. And if it smears it out, the, the processes that otherwise will take place on a plasma scale, they cannot operate. Uh, as you go to, uh, to basically the optically thin domain, yeah, then yes. More questions? I I have a little wonder of that uh, when you have modeled uh, the, the profile went broader, broader, but there was a tiny peak at about uh, 100 this is uh, the Hmm. And what 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 is the reason for that? Is it it's an annihilation line, which actually has not uh, has not been seen. What line? Annihilation. Oh, okay, uh, that. Also so it is, uh, you mean this one, or uh, hmm. uh, maybe it was more? Uh, no. You, at the end of this. At, at the end of this, it was not, not quite end. Uh, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it up and then it uh, disappears. But no, uh, no, 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 no. Just, uh, just it's, it's a little up, bit later. I mean, yeah, this, it's this, just this like thing. pops up. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's oh, nice, uh, yeah. nice thingy. And uh, what could be the reason for that? It's an annihilation line. Basically, okay. yeah, basically, actually, yeah, I didn't go into any details about this, but, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of uh, electron-positron pairs around, mm -hmm. not just electrons. And most of them are, are uh, relatively cool. By cool, I mean uh, below 1 MeV. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they annihilate there, they, they create sort of a relatively narrow line. Okay. At 511 keV in the co-moving frame, which when you boost it by the Peter Lorentz factor, which is 300 in this case, or yeah, it saturates to 300, so you get about a couple of, like, like 100 MeV in the yeah, same frame. Nice. Thanks. More questions? Okay, then thank you very much. <laughs> For next Wednesday, any volunteer? Uh, and I do hope that maybe uh, after two weeks, uh, um, Christina Verro just defended her thesis uh, in Lund, and she promised to come here and tell about her research, but the date is not set yet. But that's all the news. Thank you.